What Steve didn't tell you is mine was a placebo. We actually gave Steve a Prozac suppository. <laughs> See, I can be quicker, Steve. I can be quicker. Okay. How many of you get nervous before your A1C test is drawn? Yeah. So one of the things I'm going to hopefully let you know by the end of our few minutes is that it's not something you should be quite as concerned about because I want to make sure you understand it. Um, this came from the internet and it's a very cool look at normal hemoglobin, which is just the molecule that carries your red blood cells, and then hemoglobin A1C, and the, the glucose is the blue on this model, and the more glucose you have, the higher the hemoglobin A1C. So let me ask you a question. It's a 21-year-old, it's an African-American woman, recently diagnosed with diabetes. Her only medical history is sickle cell disease. What is her A1C target? Less than six, less than six and a half, less than seven, or none of the above. Raise your hand if it's A. Raise your hand if it's B. Raise your hand if it's C. Raise your hand if it's D. Oh, you guys are smart. D is the right answer because of her sickle cell disease. The A1C doesn't work. So normally what happens, and we, you know, there's all the molecular chemistry is worked out on hemoglobin A1C and where the glucose binds on this molecule. But we have to realize that for, you know, 35 years, this has been the primary both clinical and research test we've had in diabetes. Everything starts and ends with hemoglobin A1C. That's what we were told in the early 1980s. So why do we put so much emphasis in this test? What well, was introduced in the 1980s, as I noted yesterday, with all of these other tools that we use, um, pumps and uh, monitoring of glucose. And then in the mid-1980s, the National Institutes of Health commissioned this group, the Diabetes Control and Complications Group, to use these tools to finally, once and for all, figure out the relationship between blood sugar control and the complications of diabetes. And the bottom line was, as I mentioned yesterday, keeping the A1C around 7% reduced the risk of eye disease, kidney disease, and nerve disease by 50 to 60%. So knowing that A1C was important, and it's important to know for this audience that there were really two groups of people in that study, one group with newly diagnosed diabetes with no retinopathy, another group with on average about eight years of diabetes, they had a little bit of retinopathy, and in both groups there was dramatic improvements in the development or the further progression of the retinopathy. And then we also found out that later in that decade, um, same findings were shown for type 2 diabetes. So the question is, is it that simple? And is there any reason to challenge the accepted dogma about these red cells and glucose, and that's all you really need to know to monitor your diabetes? So there was this study that was funded by the American Diabetes Association, and we were one of the 10 centers, actually 11 centers around the world, and this was using the first CGMs. It was using the Medtronic CGM, and what it did was, it looked to see what the average glucose was based on the CGM and then using finger stick glucose levels with a very accurate meter that is used really just in research to say what is that average glucose compared to the hemoglobin A1C. And what we did was we had people without diabetes, with type 1 diabetes, and with type 2 diabetes do this CGM for three consecutive days in three consecutive months. And we wanted to make sure their A1Cs didn't change, whether they were very low or very high. And what this shows you is that if you have an A1C of 7, your average glucose is 154. Or if you have an A1C of 9, your average glucose is 212. And in fact, to this day, many of the lab reports, they come back and they say your A1C is 7.5, so your average glucose is 167. It actually says that on the lab report. And the people who funded this with the American Diabetes Association thought this was a big deal to let both doctors and patients know what the estimated hemoglobin A1C was. But there was one itsy-bitsy problem with this. 
And it was not noted in the discussion of the paper, but there was a table, table two, that showed these 95% confidence intervals. And all that means is that 95% of the values for whatever that number is falls between these numbers. So let's look at the A1C of seven again. You can have, you can have these blood sugars range from 123 to 185 and still normally have an A1C of seven. Or even if you go down to nine, you can have your glucose from 170 to 249 and your A1C can still be nine. What this means, folks, is that you can have an A1C of seven and literally have a higher average glucose than somebody with an A1C of nine. And these are people without anemia, without anything going on with their red blood cells at all, without liver disease, without kidney disease, these are people who are otherwise completely normal with nothing else going on, yet this is what the A1C is. And, and I, for years, I, we download meters in Seattle, and the glucose levels look really high, but the A1C comes back really low, and it's over and over and over for that same patient. And what we've learned is, for an individual patient, the A1C is pretty consistent over one's lifetime. Now there are things that can change it. If you develop an anemia for whatever reason, um, going through menopause may change it. There's all kinds of things that can change things, but it's pretty consistent, which is why I can't compare my hemoglobin A1C to anybody in the audience. Did you know that? I think that's pretty important. You can't compare the A1C levels between two people. So we did a study with the JDRF a few years later, and the bottom line is we showed the same thing. Here's an A1C of seven, and look how wide it is with an A1C of seven or also an A1C of eight. And you have this huge overlap, huge overlap. So when we say your, your goal is to get below seven, realize it can mean different things for different people. And it gets more interesting because we are now getting paid on patients A1C. We are telling patients it's okay to get pregnant based on A1C. That's garbage. It's not the A1C, it's the glucose that's the enemy, not the hemoglobin A1C. And the average person, doctor, patient has to understand this. And there's also this thing called a glycation gap, which means the A1C is so far off what the average glucose is that there's a real problem here, and we call that a glycation gap, and there are individuals. Look at this person here. Here's one person with an average glucose of 210, yet the A1C is about six and a half. That's a glycation gap. Here's someone with an A1C of eight and an average glucose of about 140. Glycation gap. So we use that a lot, and this is what we teach our fellows in Seattle. So this was a study that was just published a few weeks ago, it was presented at last year's um, American Diabetes Association. Look at the differences between African Americans and, and Caucasians, and these are patients with type 1 diabetes. But again, notice that when you look at all comers, a hemoglobin A1C of 8 can mean that the average glucose ranges from 120 to about 210. That's what it shows. So, what my friends in Tampa did, they had these four studies um, with almost 600 people compared to the American Diabetes Association study, which was in 19, or excuse me, in 2008. And the bottom line is they show about the same thing. These large variations in average glucose, these 95% confidence intervals are about the same what was shown in almost a decade ago and now, and again, one can have an A1C of seven and have a higher average glucose than somebody with an A1C of nine. Really important. So what does all this mean? In the best of circumstances, there is wide variability in the A1C from person to person. And this is due to different glycation rates. The, a glycation rate is just the time it takes for glucose to bind to the hemoglobin. And it's not the same in all of us. It's all different. Guess what, folks? Our red blood cells don't survive at the same rate either. The red blood cells are turned over in the spleen. What do you think happens if somebody has to have their spleen taken out? Well, their A1C is, is literally worthless in that situation. 
So the good news is, is that unless one develops an anemia, requires a blood transfusion or some other major change in the kinetics of this red cell glycation, one's A1C will be stable for each individual over their life, except not necessarily so for women. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a woman. It should be 50%. What's the issue with the ladies in the room? Iron. Why do women have to be more skeptical about their A1C tests than men? It has to do with iron. The, the 2010 census, 112 million women in the childbearing age of 18 to 44 years old. 10% of this population is iron deficient. 5% of them are anemic. And the bottom line is there's millions of women who are either iron deficient or they are anemic from iron deficiency. So what? Well. Well, in your case, Steve, with the sex change or just plastic surgery, it won't affect your A1C. <laughs> I'm just answering as, 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 as they come. So here's the thing. Iron deficiency causes you to have a falsely elevated A1C. Falsely high, ladies. So look at these data. This is from a pediatrics journal in 1999. Steve, this was when you were going through puberty. Look what happened here. <laughs> Here we have patients with type 1 diabetes with anemia, and the A1C, by just treating the iron deficiency, went from 10.6 to 8.3. That was just treating iron. Iron. Draw the A1C from 10.6 to 8.3. And this, this is even more interesting in people without diabetes. The A1C went from 7.7 .7 to 6.4. You can cure diabetes by treating with iron. <laughs> The point is, we use A1C to make the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, but you can't do it if they're anemic. You can't do it if the person is anemic, which is many of the ladies in this room. What, do we, what we have known for 35 years, there are many reasons A1C levels may be falsely measured to be low, and we know what these are, but there's also reasons that they may be falsely high. There are more reasons why they may be falsely low than high. By the way, we're not as smart as we think we are. This was a study from 1963, okay? Steve, how old were you in 1960? Oh, you're the same age as you act now. Let me show you what happened. <laughs> Let me show you what happened. These, these were from a bunch of surgeons. These were from a bunch of surgeons in Portland, Oregon. And what they did was they looked at people who had heart murmurs, and they had aortic stenosis, they had mitral valve prolapse, Many of you may have this in the room. Raise your hand if you have a heart murmur. A lot of you. Now this is really important. They also had patients who had aortic valve replacements, a very common surgery in people who have aortic stenosis, which are, it's a congenital problem. And what they did was they looked at the red blood cell survival. How long do these red cells live? And normally they live 90 days, 120 days in that ballpark. But if you have a heart murmur causing a, from a st significant heart valve problem, as it turns out, the um, half-life of the red cells are lower. The, the lifespan of these red cells are down 25%, which means if you have a heart murmur, there's a chance if the lifespan of your red cells are 25% lower, your A1Cs are going to be 25% lower. Most doctors don't know that. Really important. That's why I use a stethoscope. Seriously, I want to see if they have a heart murmur because I know it may mess up their A1C. Really important. Now, these are data that we just uh, put into a, um, a poster uh, that we, another ADA-funded study, where we were looking at this in people with kidney disease. And the bottom line is, depending on where your kidney disease is, your A1C will be more off. And we've known this, but this is the first data that we've actually done this with people with um, kidney disease, looking at CGM and how it relates to A1C. And as it turns out, the worse the kidney disease, the more off the A1C will be. So the question is, well, this is all interesting. What alters A1C? Do we know? What are the, a few of the things that will alter it? And as it turns out, the list is huge. <laughs> Look at all the cameras coming out. 
Am I being tweeted right now? I, I don't know. I, I'm not a tweeter. I don't know how that works. But this is, so we actually looked at this twice in our clinic. What we found is that in our clinic that we could figure out between 14 and 25% of our patients who we measure A1Cs, the A1Cs don't work. At least they don't work based on what the studies show within that very wide range of what A1C should be. So this is really important for you to know for yourself. So this is just an idea. This is a lady who's African American. We know the A1Cs are gonna read high in African Americans. Her A1C is 8.1%, and this is the new Freestyle Libre Pro, where we put this sensor on her arm for two weeks, and what you can see here is that her average was 143. The calculation for her A1C should be 6.6. Her actual A1C was 8.1. You can't, you, you know, you can't, you know, if it's 8.1, what that means is, you know, maybe we should start adding bedtime insulin. She has type 2 diabetes. I'm not going to add bedtime insulin to her. Her blood sugars right now are under 100 in the middle of the night. That's why you can't use A1C as a standalone. You have to use glucose. So CGM is now allowing clinicians to see how poorly A1C defines blood glucose control for some patients. So here's my take. It's still the gold standard, despite everything I said. We don't have anything better. For the majority of patients, it still accurately reflects the overall control, and it does match well with that first study I showed you called the ADAC study or the JDRF study for estimated average glucose for the majority of people. However, as a gold standard, it has limitations, and hopefully you would all agree with that. Furthermore, there are many reasons clinicians need to understand why it will not work well for certain common clinical situations, and I really should change the slide to clinicians and patients. You need to know this, because there's a good chance that even what I've just said in the last few minutes, some of your doctors won't know about this stuff. It works best when addressing glycemic control for a population, clinical trials, but it is more difficult to use when comparing individuals. So if we're, when those clinical trials I showed yesterday, and I show one group had an A1C of whatever and another group whatever, it's, it's really good for that because all the problems with A1C gets lost because it's the same for both groups. So for looking at clinical trials, it's really great. But when I'm looking at one person across the desk with me in my, in my office, and I say, Dr. Edelman, your A1C is 11%. That's really high. Let me see your CGM. And then I see his average on his CGM is 240. I know the 11% is right. <laughs> now, sorry, I'm still getting you from yesterday. I'm making this up as I go here. And it's bad because I just had my coffee. For, for every patient I see, I consciously check to see if the average of the finger stick or the CGM matches the A1C. I do this every single patient, and it's just... You know, it's like brushing my teeth. I don't even think about it. I look to see if it matches. And if it doesn't, then I start going to figure out why it doesn't. Now, here's the most important study you've never heard about if you have type 1 diabetes. And, and this gives me a great opportunity. Remember what I said. If you, have, if you have looking at a population, A1C is good. If you're looking at individuals, it's not. This was 1,600 adolescents stratified from 1990 to 2009 in Australia. And what they did in Australia is that instead of making sure everyone goes to the eye doctor every year, they just did photographs of the retinas in the endocrinologist's office and then they sent them to the ophthalmologist. But everybody had a picture of their eyeball. I wish I had a picture of your eyeball here, Steve, but I don't. <laughs> this is why we're so confused. And this is, this is I want to walk you through this. Back in the era, in the early 1990s, this first bar here is retinopathy. 52% of these adolescents had retinopathy. Now here's the good news. Over the course of the next 19 years, we're down here to only about 15% of these kids with retinopathy. And this is what we're seeing in the United States too. Um, even though you saw the graph yesterday, A1Cs are not where we'd like them to be. When we look at the population, our retinopathy is going down. Now look at this middle bar. This middle bar is using multiple injections or an insulin pump. What it is, it's giving mealtime insulin, which is what we talked about yesterday. And what you can see in 1990, it was 18%, and by 2009, 
we're at about 90% of people getting mealtime insulin. That's interesting. Mealtime insulin went way up, retinopathy went way down. The more interesting thing is, this is hemoglobin A1C less than 7.5%. It essentially stayed the same. The A1C was not what was driving. The, the, the average A1C went like from 9.1 to 8.8. .8. Very little change. But it wasn't the A1C that was driving the retinopathy. It was taking injections with each meal. And this is why I've become so interested in the variability of glucose. So my takeaways for everyone with type 1 diabetes, treat the glucose, not the A1C. That's the message I want you to get from this discussion. And that Steve's A1C is 11.5%. Those are, the two, those are the two messages. Use mealtime insulin, either with pumps or MDI. I don't think I have to convince this audience of that. Avoid excessive hypoglycemia, really important. Perfection is not required, or for that matter, for the most part, even possible with today's tools. That's going to change, but for right now, don't expect perfection, and don't sweat a bad day or even a bad week. So to conclude. Patients, parents, and payers need to learn about this because right now they don't understand it. And conclusion number two from Abe Lincoln, I destroy my enemies when I make them my friends. If Abe was here today, he would agree the enemy is glucose, not hemoglobin A1C. Thank you very much.